All right, let's do this. Welcome to Fantasy Baseball today on Monday, January 11th. I'm back. Frank Sample here with Scott White. No Chris Towers, but he'll be back on tomorrow's pod. Scott, thank you so much for holding down the fort. You did a great job while I was away on a uh, luxurious vacation, locked away in my apartment in New York, <laughs> binge-watching Cobra Kai and the boys. I completed ah. uh, Donkey Kong Country 1, the Super Nintendo video game. Uh, they remade it for the Nintendo Switch. So that's basically what I've been doing the entire week. Scott, have you played Donkey Kong Country 1 or watched either of those shows, Cobra Kai or The Boys? I have not watched either of those shows. Oh, they're, I kind of really I hoped you had binged Mandalorian like I did <laughs> on my vacation so we could have another conversation about that. Uh, but no, I haven't watched those two. Usually my my approach to two shows is to watch them ideally in their last season so I can kind of experience the finale with everybody, but I don't have to wait in between seasons. Um, and, and, you know, failing that, I just wait till the show's completely over and, and, and just take it all in all at once. I feel like that's, I feel like that's fairer to, uh, to the person putting together the story to uh, not have your anticipation filling in so many gaps along the way. Um, so no, I haven't watched either of those yet, but I'm interested in both. I hope to watch them someday. I have played the original Donkey Kong Country before on Super Nintendo. Um, not a lot, but I've played it before. I'm familiar. Oh man, that game uh, <laughs> that game stirred up anger in me that I did not know existed, Scott. So <laughs> that was uh, that was very fun. Um, Cobra Kai was. Great. I was, for someone who didn't live in the 80s, I am a sucker for 80s nostalgia. I, <laughs> Stranger Things was great. Uh, Cobra Kai was really, really good, too. So I just couldn't stop watching. And, and Nostalgia now, for something you didn't experience. Exactly, yourself. right? But it, it, I always <laughs> said that I, I wished I was this age during the late 80s, early 90s. I, I was born in 1991. So again, like I, yeah. I didn't really get to enjoy it. But so mm. many great things um, were made, started in the 80s, so I, I kind of wish I lived through that. We could do a whole podcast on those things, uh, but the people want fantasy baseball talk. I am pumped to be back. I genuinely missed being here. Uh, I missed you, Scott, uh, so I'm happy to be back, um, but uh, <laughs> but but especially <laughs> excited because uh, January really marks the transition for everybody into fantasy baseball. I, I see people being more active on our Facebook group and people asking more questions and emailing us as well, so really excited to get into it. Uh, we do have a move that happened. We had uh, Kyle Schwarber sign with the Nationals. We have a few other notes that we'll get to as well. Uh, but the, the main point of today's podcast will be what you miss in September while football was going on. So if you just finished fantasy football, yes, the playoffs are still going on, the NFL playoffs, but you might be coming back and, and you want a little refresher. What happened in the month of September? Scott wrote an awesome article, so we'll look over some of those things that happened there. We have a few dynasty questions that were emailed to us, fantasybaseball at cbsi.com. We'll get to those a little bit later on in the podcast as well. Kyle Schwarber signs a one-year $7 million deal with the Washington Nationals, has an $11 million mutual option for 2022. Nationals manager Dave Martinez has indicated that the early expectation for the batting order will be Trey Turner leadoff, Juan Soto batting second, Josh Bell batting third, Kyle Schwarber batting fourth, cleanup spot, and Starlin Castro batting fifth. The ADP this time last year for Schwarber, 133. He was a top 150 pick. Uh, he was coming off of a top 20 outfielder season in both Roto and head-to-head -head points in 2019. Uh, and then this past season, uh, didn't really live up to things. Batting average plummeted, hit more ground balls, strikeouts. Just a really, really streaky hitter. So what do you think about this uh, the signing in general, Scott, and, and the value for Kyle Schwarber? I mean, it's possible he, he bounces back. He's still in the prime of his career. 2019 was a career season which is part of the reason he was targeted so high. Um, he made, uh, he, he, his, he improved his strikeout rate quite a bit in the second half of 2019 and ended up hitting 280 with a 997 OPS, 20 home runs in the second half of that year. So a lot of momentum heading into 2020. And then he just fell flat on his face. The strikeout rate was back up. You know, went from a career best season to, I guess, a career worst season but still in the prime of his career. He's never been very good against left-handed pitchers. Uh, he was actually okay in 2019, but historically has not been good and not a good defender in left field. So it, there's 
incentive beyond just those poor splits to take him out of the lineup from time to time. And so I'm not super high on him. I, I feel like I feel like 2019 we're gonna is going to end up being more the exception than the rule. I don't mind him as a cheap source of power late, but I feel like feel like that he'll be at a playing time disadvantage. And I feel like, you know, 250 is probably the high end of what he's going to hit given his shortcomings. Yeah, Schwarber, I think we kind of know who he is at this point. He's a slugger. He can hit for power in the middle of a, not a great lineup. I'll call it a pretty decent lineup. There's two superstars at the top of it, but so there should be our RBI opportunities for him. Uh, the one thing I noticed for Schwarber in, in 2020, this shortened season, first 36 games, he was pretty much normal Schwarber, 238 batting average, 857 OPS, 10 homers, was hitting the ball extremely hard, a 94 mile per hour average exit velocity during that time. Final 23 games, he hit just 101 with a 427 OPS, uh, one home run during that time period, and the ground balls really just got out of control, and he didn't hit the ball nearly as hard. So we know that he is very streaky, um, and we should probably expect more of that, but you, I think you're getting him at a, at a pretty decent discount. The ADP as of now is 201, and I will point out for everyone uh, who normally uses NFBC, you can continue to use that source if you want. The Fantasy Pros ADP, which lumps together... RT Sports, NFBC, and Fantrax is currently available. So that is now And, and it, will, it will add more that it's factoring in as more data becomes available. I mean, I, I don't think there have been any... There's, there's any draft results from our site, for instance, but it'll yep. eventually be included in the, the Fantasy Pros data. So, yeah. I mean, we don't need to be totally NFBC-focused here with, with that. Uh, I will say Kyle Schwarper said... After signing this deal, I got this from MLB.com. He says he needs to get back into his legs. And I love when players say things like that because it comes across like they think we're supposed to know what they mean. <laughs> get back into my <laughs> legs. I, I assume that means he had some mechanical issues going on in 2020. That's what I'm going to interpret that as. Uh, but he's been in contact with the Nationals hitting coach, Kevin Long. And, uh, you know, it's... 2020 was probably a fluke the other way, but I don't really expect him to be as good as 2019 again either. Yeah, so I mentioned the ADP is 201. I really kind of like this range. Just going ahead of him, Jesse Winker, Andrew McCutcheon, Trey Mancini. Obviously, I mean, we got to figure out what's going on with Trey Mancini, but as of now, everything has been positive, and it looks like he's going to be ready for spring training with the Baltimore Orioles. So, Scott, I mean, you see those four outfielders on the board, Mancini, McCutcheon, Winker, Schwarber. Where would you, uh, where would you be leaning there? I would actually lean um, Mancini because like I'm all about upside late. And I think that's, that's the upside. I mean, that Trey Mancini's best season is the best of any of those players, right? You, you rattled the names off pretty quick, but I think that's true. Uh, McCutcheon, um, but we know McCutcheon's not going to get yeah, back to the superstar. He right, used to be right. Yeah. He's, he's clearly post prime. So Mancini, it's just, does he come, does he bounce all the way back from, uh, dealing col- it was colon cancer, right? That he's coming back from. I believe and, so. Yeah, uh, you know, pretty went through some went through some stuff last year, and it it may have it may have kind of depleted him physically. Some we don't we don't exactly know how he's going to come back, and you know, I, I guess it's possible. As things stand now, he's supposed to be ready for spring training. I'll just put it that way. And if if that's so, and he looks. He looks 100%. He's clearly going to be the guy I want to draft here, and I think he'll be a huge discount. Yep. Yep, I I would agree with that. I think his upside is the highest. We've seen that before, what he did back in 2019. Trey Mancini, 291 batting average, 35 homers, and 899 OPS. He was fantastic, but I I think there's... uh, I think these are all pretty good value. So I think after Mancini, it depends what you need. McCutcheon, if you need a little bit of speed... um, and just an all-around player, that's fine. Schwarber is definitely going to give you power. If you look at just after him, there's not really great power sources after Schwarber here. So if you're just focused in on like 30-plus homers, this is uh, this is probably one of the last bats that you're going to find that could do it in this range. Some other news, uh, specifically for the Detroit Tigers. I believe their GM, Al Avila, had a press conference, Zoom call, so he answered a bunch of questions, said that Casey Mize and Tarek Skubal will compete for a spot in the rotation. As of now, it looks like there's only one spot available. Matthew Boyd, Spencer Turnbull, Michael Fulmer, and Jose Urania are the first four. That can easily change if one of those guys is just super bad or um, 
gets injured. So I guess we'll that's something to follow. Uh, Matt Manning is expected to start in the minors. I think we kind of all expected that as well. And uh, Willie Castro will be the team's starting shortstop. He was actually one of the names that you wrote about in your article, Scott, about what people might have missed in September. And he was really good. He played 36 games down the stretch, uh, 369 batting average, six home runs. He's going to be the starting shortstop for the Tigers. Anything to see there? Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think he overachieved. I think the expected stats show as much. It's it's not like he was, you know, he was a prospect of some note coming up through the minors, but not somebody who was expected to put up the kind of numbers he did in a short, uh, in a small sample last year. Um, you know, the plate discipline's pretty bad. The hard hit rate, I mean, average exit velocity was bottom 6% of the league, so it doesn't hit the ball especially hard. And yet, he did have an expected batting average of 299, much lower than the 349 he actually hit. Uh, but I would imagine, uh, I don't remember top of mind, but I would imagine that that must mean there's pretty good line drive tendencies there. And uh, I think for Willie Castro, um, I could see him becoming being someone who delivers like the typical Gene Segura season. I think that's what the upside is for him. Not, not those two seasons Gene Segura had where he was a stud, not quite that high, but like the typical Gene Segura season where, you know, maybe 12 to 15 homers, 20 or so steals and a respectable batting average with, with, with a low on base percentage. I think there's a chance Castro could be that. He could be worse than that. I don't think he's going to be much better than that. Yeah, and that would be a pretty damn good player. I mean, that would be yeah. a uh, a mixed Roto League relevant middle infielder for sure. And um, speaking on Willie Castro, his uh, in 2019 in AAA in the minors, 11 homers, 17 steals. So does have some of that power speed combination. And yes, he had a 26.9% line drive rate. So that definitely helps with uh, the BABIP, the batting average, and the expected batting average as well. Japanese starting pitcher Tomoyuki Sagano who some people were excited about, will return to the Yomiuri Giants for the 2021 season. He has an opt-out after next season as well, so this is probably something we're going to be following next year to see um, if he's posted and, and if teams are interested in him again. I assume that they will be. Uh, former Angels clubhouse attendant Brian Harkins. This is interesting. This is a story that people have been talking about all weekend. He named Garrett Cole, Max Scherzer, Adam Wainwright, among others, as players he supplied ball doctoring substances to prior to his firing last March. Scott, does this matter at all? I assume every pitcher in baseball is using something. That, that seems to be the assumption. I, I don't know. I, I had trouble getting outraged by this. I, I didn't see a lot of outrage by this. I, I think he's only putting it out there because he's hoping to... Uh, um, <laughs> he's hoping to, I, I guess, get back and in somebody's good graces by uh, exposing this, this uh, scandal. But I, I just think, I just think people are, are, um, they've, they've kind of, they've kind of met their limit on scandals. So I, I, I don't, I don't think much is going to happen with this. Yeah, that probably seems like the wrong way to do it too, right? Blowing the whistle on uh, people using substances, uh, pitchers using substances while uh, to help them gain spin rates or whatever it might be. I mean, there was a great article by Eno Saris of The Athletic where he basically pointed out a, a bunch of pitchers and he had all different kinds of sources and people talking about how 99% of pitchers in the MLB are using some kind of substance right now. So it's really not yeah. surprising. I don't, I, I'm not really making anything out of this story. It's just whatever. Yeah, Garrett Cole I, was in the I news. Think, I, I don't know if it was Eno Saris or somebody who's a writer kind of like him um, you know, raised the possibility that Maybe MLB should just introduce some kind of substance that's legal. Yep, he wrote about that in the article. Yeah, yep. yeah, and just and, and that way it doesn't have to be a controversy because you know it, it is a not having enough grip on the ball is a safety issue. Uh, now, I, you know, I, pitchers use it because it makes them better too. It can put yeah. more spin on their pitches. It's not just that, but it's like you want that you want pitchers to be able to grip the ball well and um it's apparently they're not going to grip it so well if they don't have some kind of tacky substance there to help them 
Yeah, and then that goes back to the the type of ball that they're using now as well. So there there's a whole bunch of different factors in play here, but uh, it's a talking point, and we'll we'll see you know what MLB uh, does in regard to substances for pitchers. The Orioles have talked to the uh, to have talked to Jonathan VR about a potential reunion. Richie Martin is currently penciled in as their starting shortstop, so I think VR would be welcome there, especially from a fantasy perspective. VR's early ADP is 126. That's about 80 spots later than he was being drafted last year. Definitely would welcome him uh, back to Baltimore. It's a good ballpark to hit in. Should help his power. And if he plays every day, I think that's all he really needs in order to... I mean, that's an ideal landing spot for him. One, we know that Park serves him well. But two, I I have him currently ranked like he's not going to be an everyday player just because, I mean, he wasn't good enough to do it for the Marlins. So if he lands somewhere where he can't be, he would rock it up my rankings for sure. Yep, likewise, I haven't ranked really low, but uh, it's hard to do anything more because we don't know where he's going to play. As of now, again, that's Jonathan VR. Mets president Sandy Alderson has, quote, made it clear that he is not comfortable with Dominic Smith as a left fielder. So uh, we're rooting for you, DH, in the National League. We'll, we'll continue to see what happens here. Um, there's been really no updates, Scott. So at, like, if the season started tomorrow, there's no DH in the National League, which means Dominic Smith is... Probably not playing all that much. Uh, I read an article recently from Jeff Zimmerman. He does Mining the News over at Fangraphs where he kind of uh, goes through all these different kind of articles and, and picks out fantasy-relevant items. And there was an article recently that said, don't rule out the possibility of Dom Smith and Pete Alonso platooning at first base if uh, if there's no DH. I, I don't think we'll get that far, but that was the first time I ever even heard of that as a possibility, Scott. Yeah, that sounds... Sounds, Sounds wild. like a lot, a lot of wasted asset there. Like I, I feel like including those guys in a trade would be preferable to that. And you know what? Like I don't, I don't have, you know, I, I, I only know what uh, Sandy Alderson said. You know, he's not comfortable. I, I don't. Maybe there's more context to that that would tell me more. But not being comfortable with Dominic Smith and playing left field and and not playing Dominic Smith and left field are two different things. So. That that's worth keeping in mind too. But yeah, it's it's. I had hoped there would be more clarity after the Mets got rid of two infielders to get one back in that major deal with Cleveland. Uh, I, but it sounds like it's still there's still reason to be anxious about that if you're investing in Dominic Smith, or or maybe Pete Alonso. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I think the national signing uh, Kyle Schwarber means maybe they know something that we don't about the DH coming to. The National League. If not, Schwarber could just play left field. He's done it with the Cubs the past couple of seasons, but maybe they know something. Maybe I'm just reading into it uh, because I really want Tom Smith to be a thing. So let's see what happens with the uh, National League DH. I just want to quickly plug a few things. Do you own a smart speaker? Maybe you got one for Christmas, uh, whether it's an Alexa or a Google Home. You can listen to Fantasy Baseball today without lifting a finger. Simply say, Alexa. Play the latest episode of Fantasy Baseball of the Fantasy Baseball Today podcast or Hey Google, play the latest episode of the Fantasy Baseball Today podcast and it's easy as that. Um, our Facebook group I mentioned is very active right now. I encourage you to get involved if you have a question or if you maybe want to help others out. You want to get involved mm-hmm. in just some general discussion. There's a lot of dynasty questions being asked right now. So you can find that at facebook.com slash groups slash Fantasy Baseball Today. And uh, you may have realized last week, but for the rest of January, we'll be producing four podcasts per week. Three of those are going to be fantasy baseball related uh, with Scott, Chris. Chris will be on most of them and myself. Uh, You'll hear those Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And then we'll have a a bonus baseball podcast with our friends Danny Vietti and former major leaguer Will Middlebrooks. They have great guests on every single week. Last week they had Marcus Stroman on actually. And uh, maybe I'll clip out a, a segment of that because he was talking about some new pitches that he's been working on and changing up his pitch mix. So that's something that could definitely be relevant for uh, Marcus Stroman and fantasy baseball alike. Things you missed in September. A lot of people paying attention to fantasy football throughout September. Uh, and this is probably more relevant of an article uh, and just an idea in general, Scott, over the course of a full season. I guess um, the fact that the baseball season was only two months means maybe people were still paying closer attention to uh, baseball than they usually do. But I, I thought Maybe. it was, I thought it was good to just kind of let's bring some back, let's bring some things up that we remember that happened and uh, 
remind people here and, and kind of talk this out from a fantasy perspective. So we'll start off with some of the bad before we get to the good. But um, Luis Robert, I think, is going to be a really a really big talking point all offseason and leading up to drafts in March, Scott, because he was really good. I mean, he took the league by storm, looked like he was going to run away with uh, the American League Rookie of the Year. Looks like maybe he's trending towards being a second, maybe even a first-round pick for fantasy purposes, and then just completely crashed and burned in September. So uh, I guess remind people what you saw and what happened with Luis Robert, and uh, are you comfortable with taking him? His ADP right now is 40, so... 12-team league, I mean, that's the back end of the third, early fourth round. What do you think about Robert there? Well, clearly that ADP, I, I assume you're getting that from Fantasy Pros or NFBC? Yeah, so Fantasy Pros, um, all those sources combined, ADP is mm-hmm. 40, 40 overall okay. for Luis so Robert. Those are the numbers you're citing, because yep. NFBC sells out pretty hard for upside, generally. And uh, so that would make sense for him to go that high. But cl- either way, clearly that's a five by five ranking and he is a player geared for five by five leagues right now because you can count on him for a healthy number of stolen bases. The, but the play discipline is pretty horrid. 32.2% strikeout rate doesn't get much worse than that stands to reason. He ended up hitting 233. Uh, actually the expected batting average was 226. Um, he Definitely showed he can hit the ball hard and like the power is going to translate. Um, we he's going to run a lot, which was one of the questions that we had about him coming into the season, with given the White Sox history with some potential base dealers who didn't live up to it. Like the power speed is going to be there. Is he going to become a disciplined enough hitter to be respectable in batting average? I imagine he will someday. But in his first, what's going to be his first full season, um, I'm not going to invest. I, I'm I'm not going to presume that in where I draft him. And I, I feel like forty, you're you're kind of presuming it at that point. I don't. I'd have to pull up my rankings to see exactly where I have him by comparison. Um, but I think more like the sixty range than the forty range seems appropriate. And again, just for that format, it would be significantly lower in a points league. Yeah, the strikeouts are going to continue to be a massive issue. And you brought up something about uh, the base stealing. I wonder now that Rick Renteria is gone, and you know the past couple of seasons we've wanted the White Sox to run more, and I think that they have players who are talented enough and they're fast enough to go out and run. I wonder if they you know get the green light more now with uh, Tony Larusa. I did this whole thing. I looked into his his previous history. Uh, the last five seasons he spent with the Cardinals, they really didn't run all that much. They also did not really have. Uh, they didn't really have anybody who was all that fast, so I guess it comes down to your personnel. He also coached Ricky Henderson back in the uh, early 90s with the A's, but of course Ricky Henderson yeah. was a different beast in his own. So uh, we'll see. Well, maybe you know the White, the White Sox get the green light a little bit more. Um, I, I mentioned that Jeff Zimmerman article, that Mining the News article that he put out recently over on Fangraphs, and he pointed out that Luis Robert made a, a tough diving catch on September 5th he was hit by a pitch on his tricep the next day. He didn't play September 7th, so he had the day off after getting hit by the pitch. But through September 5th, 38 games, Robert was batting 270, 11 home runs, uh, 30% strikeout rate, and a 35% hard contact rate. Uh, when he returned his final 17 games, he hit 153, zero extra base hits. Uh, his hard contact rate, was 17%, Scott. It was cut in half. It went from 35% to 17%. So I do wonder if if that played into um, you know the struggles down the stretch, the fact that he was dealing with this injury. But it sounds like regardless, you're not going to pay that price. Like, I'm, I, people I are going to be... I looked it up when you were talking. I have him 59th. Yeah, I said so about you, 60th. I have him 59th in, in Roto, standard Roto rankings. So you're just going to... I mean, I'm not going to say cross him off the board, but I, I can't imagine many drafts where he's going to fall that far. People are still just really excited about him. Okay. Yeah. Probably not. Probably I'm going... Like, the thing is, if you have steals taken care of, you only need so many steals because there are so few out there, right? So you only you need to win by steals one. another way, what's the incentive to take Luis Robert? You could get an, another power hitter who's a much safer source of batting average. Would you take Luis Robert or Eloy Jimenez, his teammate? 
So I actually have, and I'm probably um, the minority here, but I actually have Eloy, Eloy Jimenez four spots higher than Robert. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be the minority because I have Eloy ahead of Robert as well. Well, unless we're just both in the minority, but uh, <laughs> I mean, they do things completely different. I, I said this before last season, I'm, I'm sticking to it. I, I think Eloy is eventually going to turn into this, this um, Nolan Arenado type in the outfield. We're just four category stud. You know, he's not going to give you any speed. Uh, and I think we're working our way towards, towards uh, Eloy Jimenez being that. So he won't give you any stolen bases, but I, I do prefer Eloy Jimenez over Luis Robert myself. Aaron Nola, his final three starts, Scott. 6.60 ERA, 1.80 whip. Not great. Not really don't like to see that after a fantastic start to the season. Um, those final three starts were pretty bad for Aaron Nola. And despite all this, I still have him ranked as my SP4 overall, Scott. I moved him just behind the big three. I'm not really worried about really? it. Really? Are you? Really? So you're even more... Uh, you have him ranked even more aggressively than I do. And it's it seems like for a second straight year, the fantasy playing world is down on Aaron Nola uh, beyond what I think they should be because I think he's pretty awesome. You know, last year... He expanded his arsenal through his changeup, got a lot more comfortable with his changeup, and it became a much more effective pitch. It seemed to make all his pitches more effective in terms of missing bats. The, the control issues of 2019 more or less went away. Uh, I think I think he just happened to hit a bump in the road there right at the end of the short season, and, and it skewed his numbers, which, I mean, it skewed it to a 328 ERA, 108 whip, and he still had 12.1 K per nine. So uh, the numbers as they were, were awesome. But if the season had ended three starts earlier for him, y- you know, he might be a first, be t- he might be a first round pick. Probably not, but, but yeah, I mean, he, he might be early second. Yeah. Yeah. So for, I mean, uh, you mentioned it, it, he hit a bump in the road, final three starts. It was really the uh, the walks that got out of control during those three starts. He had a 6.60 ERA and uh, six walks per nine. So his first nine starts, that was just 2.1 walks per nine. So the walks did get out of control a little bit towards the uh, towards the end of the season there for Aaron Nola. Uh, and, and it seems to be the only thing that, that troubles him at times. It was the same thing in 2019. The walks were 3.5 per nine and... Um, I mean, that was really the first time we ever saw them over three. If he can just get back to his 2017, 2018, where he's in those mid twos, Scott, I mean, two and a half walks per nine, uh, especially with the advancements that he's made in terms of swinging strike rate, 13% swinging strike rate in uh, 2020 was by far a career best for him. You mentioned he changed up the pitch mix a little bit. Uh, yeah, I have no problem. If, um, you know, once you get into that early mid second round, if you want to take a starting pitcher, I, I will be looking at Aaron Ola there even ahead of names like Darvish and um, Luis Castillo, who I have uh, just ranked just behind him. So I don't mind him as a second round pick. Would you actually pull the trigger there? Yeah, I think I, I wouldn't hesitate to do it. I have G, I have Nola in my second round too. I think I have Lucas Giolito in that same range. Uh, I can pull it out. I got my rankings right here. I have, so I go, well, you didn't mention Bauer. Bauer's my number four. Eh, you know, <laughs> you're, I feel about you're Bauer. Going to be un- you're not going to be deterred from being uh, scared of Bauer. That's fine. Uh, I got Bauer, then Darvish, then Nola, then Giolito. All in the middle of the second round there. So, yeah, there's a good chance I'll draft Nola a fair amount. Uh, another pitcher named Aaron, or Aaron, Savale. His final six starts... Man, remember, it was basically as soon as I made that proclamation here on the podcast, got Aaron Savale over Tyler Glass now, rest of season. I remember it like it was yesterday because as soon as I said that, Tyler Glass now became awesome and Aaron Savale became the opposite. Those final six starts, a 6.62 ERA, 1.68 whip. Uh, what did you see during those final six starts that uh, that people need to remember heading into the season? Well... I think they need to remember that he allows a lot of contact and it's not the kind of contact you want to allow. It's not, it's not a lot of ground balls. Um, you know, he's not, 
he's not really a big bat misser and he's not a really big ground ball generator. And I feel like you need to be one or the other to be a reliable fantasy option. Like he's not terrible at either, but he's not, he doesn't excel at either. So you get a 392 X fit from him, a 411 Sierra. They were even worse in 2019. Um, and I just, I, I just think that's pretty middle of the road and I don't totally understand. There, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for him among fantasy analysts at large. I don't totally understand that. I think he's, I think he's competent. I think he's solid. Um, but you know, you're going to, you're going to get some good and bad with him. And I don't think he's going to be somebody who's going to put you over the top. I mean, even in terms of, uh, like the, the expected stats like XC like that that that's more like the XERA. He was actually good at that in 2019, 332 XERA. Last year was 439. And that's of yeah. course based on stat cast, which is probability uh where the actual batted balls go, whether they're going whether they should fall as a hit or not. So you know he didn't even excel at that last year. It was actually worse in that than than something like XFIP that I usually cite. So there's not a lot of there's not a lot here for me to get excited about with Aaron Savale. Yeah, so I was the Savale guy entering last season. I really liked what I saw in the first six starts. Um, I think the biggest difference between his first six starts versus his final six were the walks. I think the walks kind of got out of control for him. Uh, those first six starts, a 0 0.9 walk per nine. He was never going to maintain that. But uh, his final six starts, that went all the way up to 3.2 walks per nine. So Savali is someone who I consider a, a better control pitcher. He also has a very diverse pitch mix, Scott. I think that's why some people in the industry might be excited about him. He throws like five different pitches. He has a four seam, a slider, a cutter, a curveball, a changeup. So he has all these different kind of breaking pitches and off-speed pitches. And uh, I think that's why people are a little bit excited about him. So the walks got out of control. Uh, those final six starts, the swinging strike rate went down. He started to tinker a little bit. But Cleveland, I kind of just always give them the benefit of the doubt. They're just really good at developing pitchers. And we saw that with uh, Zach Plesak last year. And I kind of feel like they have confidence in these guys if they're willing to trade away Carlos Carrasco. So uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, the ADP for Aaron Savale as of now is 178. He's going behind names like Bassett, Dallas Keuchel, Joe Musgrove, who is the man, obviously. Uh, if you were going to draft uh, Savale, Scott, what would you want him as? One of your, like, your SP5, as, as like one of your starters? You no, want him more as no like worse a... than, no higher than that, I should say. Okay. Yeah, I mean, ideally me with how deep I want my pitching to be, more like a, a uh, sixth starter. Yeah, bench pitcher, right? Honestly, I don't expect to draft him at all unless I just, unless I just strike out with the, with the kind of pitchers I'd rather be drafting. But it sounds like the consensus ADP there is more in line with with my rankings. Some of the pitchers I have just a little ahead of Savale are like Dallas Keuchel and Joe Musgrove. Uh, Michael Pineda, Jose Urquidy are also right there in that same range as guys I like a little more. Okay, so we're not, we're not far off. But um, yeah, I, I do like Savale, I think, a little bit more than you do. Probably closer to, to where the industry is on Aaron Savali. We're going to hit a quick break. When we return, we do have some partial redemptions towards the end of the season. And then, of course, some surprises. Some players that really kind of came out of nowhere and um, ex uh, performed better than we expected them to. We'll do that here. Fantasy Baseball Today. We're back here. And it was about the time that Luis Robert started to fall off that Adalberto Mondesi Scott did exactly the opposite. Uh, just really kind of flipped a switch in September and went off his final 22 games, 376 batting average, six homers, 22 runs, 16 steals. Some people might have even dropped him in their leagues, and he wound up being a league winner for you know people who either picked him, picked him back up, or or, or held him all season. So uh, Adalberto Mondesi, are you buying this late season surge that we saw out of him? He is. Going, uh, pull up the ADP here. Adalberto Mondesi is going 28th. So early third round pick. He's, uh, he's right back there, Scott. Would you do it? Would I do it? Early third round pick. Of course, uh, in Roto only. Yeah, we're, we're not drafting him that early in a, in a points league. Of course. A bit like probably the single 
player with the biggest difference in value between the two formats because like he's his 24 steals in a 60 game season um i think the next closest was 16 right and like only four people were even halfway to 24 including including him something like that it was like he's a distant number one in steals like the guy who could carry you in the category and with enough track record of being that, that you can feel pretty confident in it. So regardless of what he does as a hitter, that has a lot of value at a time when stolen bases are so scarce. You can just take care of the category with him. Um, and, the, and then the fact that he's kind of teased us with this possibility that he's a good hitter or at least contributes something other than steals. Uh, it's just a nice bonus. I mean, he's done it, obviously, September, the ridiculous month he had in 2020. And then uh, the second half of 2018, I believe it was. Uh, which, And then he was pretty strong at the start of 2019, too. Mm-hmm. So the thing to remember about him is he played with a torn labrum. He was coming back from a torn labrum last year. So maybe that explains why um, why August was so bad relative to September. At the same time, I mean, the strikeout rate was awful in both. It was, it was roughly the same, about 30% both in August and September. And you're not you're not going to see too many hitters succeed with a strikeout rate that high. Usually the ones who do are like elite, elite power hitters, like, uh, you know, Aaron Judge level, uh, you know, maybe like a Jorge Soler could could get away with striking out that much. Miguel Sano, not usually a guy who, you know, just has a modest amount of power like Mondesi. So I'm still skeptical. I'm still skeptical he's going to be more than... uh, I'm still skeptical he's he's going to be even a decent hitter. I think there's enough power there that if he's, you know, hitting 225, 230 with all those steals, he lives up to third round value in this one format i think it's possible um so let's see let me see where i actually have him ranked i have him ranked 31 so i'm 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 there but like mm. i don't uh, think he's who he who he looked like he was in september i just think september was a reminder that he's probably good enough with all his steals to justify that kind of investment but scott would you do it would I do well? I, I mean, I'm ranking him 31st, so yeah, I think I would. I think if I would. you if like, you started your draft, say, I don't, you had the fifth pick, and uh-huh. you start with either Jacob Degrom or Garrett Cole. You start with two pitchers. Would you take Adalberto Mondesi in the third round of a roto draft as your first hitter? I'm I might because the, then you got the biggest scarcities filled with your first three picks, high end starting pitcher and the best base stealer. Now, if I got like Ronald Acuna or Fernando Tatis in the first round, I already had a big advantage in steals from them. Well, obviously Fernando Tatis doubling up on short stuff, probably wouldn't do that. But the point is the steals. If you already, if you've already have, if you've already taken a big bite out of the steals, Apple, uh, when round three comes up, you're probably not going on to see, but if you have none at that point, it's, it, it's something I would definitely consider doing. I suspect in most of my drafts, regardless of format, round three is I'm going to go pitcher in most of them. But, you know, if, if it's a draft where I happen to get a pitcher in round one, maybe not. Yeah, I thought the point you made about his uh, shoulder injury was, was probably, uh, for me, the one that stood out most. And, and it's something mm-hmm. that... Uh, we've seen uh, Conforto, it wasn't a labor, it was, I, it was some kind of other shoulder surgery that he had, but we saw it took him a whole season to get back on track. We saw uh, Jesse Winker, it took basically a whole season, and I think that actually was a labor. So with the shoulder injuries, it takes some time. So I think that could explain why his first 37 games, Alberto Mondesi did perform as poorly as he did, changed the batted ball data, started hitting more fly balls, and he actually hits the ball really hard for you know someone who we consider a speedster is Average exit velocity, 90.6 miles per hour. That was in the 78th percentile. So that that's pretty damn good for uh, for one Adalberto Mondesi. He's got Frankie Montas. He was, along with Zach Gallen and Max Fried, uh, one, one of three of my favorite breakout picks for 2020. And it didn't really happen. It, it was a weird season for him. His first st- four starts were 
on on the surface very good. The underlying numbers during the, that time were not good. Then he dealt with a back injury. Uh, his next, I believe it was six starts, were not great at all. They were actually quite bad. And then he finishes the season with this six innings pitch, two earned runs, 13 strikeouts. What do you make of Montas and his 2020? It was such a weird season. Yeah, it was a, a weird season. But that last start, it, for it being such a short season, was enough for me to say, okay, we can't, we shouldn't completely bury this guy. Because remember, there was, when he was struggling early on, there was concern. Okay, the splitter's what made him in 2019. And he's just not featuring it as much. He started featuring it more as the season went on. Um, also, the swinging strike rate overall ended up being very similar to 2019. So the jump he saw with the addition of that splitter in 2019, it's not like he lost a lot of swinging strikes uh, when he kind of faded it a little in 2020. So I'm... It's he, he's definitely a player, Frankie Montas, where I, I wish we could have gotten four months extra to really know what's going on with him. Cause it's just, you know, some players they don't get going till mid to late May. And 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 you know, if we if we were assessing them up to that point, we'd have a very different impression of them. It's just it's kind of unfair to um it's kind of unfair to us. It's kind of unfair to the players too, to say, all right, I know, I know what this guy is after 60 games when obviously we wouldn't feel that way at all. If it was 162 game season. And I think Montas really exemplifies that. Oh, that was it. I thought that was the end of the I, sentence. I thought, I thought Did you that were not sound like an end of the sentence to you. <laughs> it didn't sound like the end of the sentence to me. I thought you were ready to say something else, but um, yeah, yeah I always cite you know 2019 first 60 games, uh, you Darvish and, and Jose Ramirez, right? Like, what if we had to judge those that hitter and that pitcher after their first 60 games? It, it, what would we be left with? I mean, we, nothing but questions, and it's kind of similar to a lot of players that we're dealing with here. You also wrote in your article uh, regarding Montas that manager Bob Melvin said that he got back to, quote, pitching angry after overthinking his mechanics and his pitch selection all season. Um, so just yeah. pitch angry. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else to say, Montas. Uh, I think that he has legitimate talent. He throws the ball hard. Uh, his splitter is really good. We've seen this with other pitchers who rely on the splitter, is that uh, if that pitch is not working, then it really could kind of derail the rest of their pitch mix. So that's always kind of in the back of my mind. But um, same question as uh, Savali, Scott. What would you want Montas as if you were drafting him? Your SP4, SP5, would you be all right with with, with him as one of your starters? I have him ahead of Savali. I have, I, so I have Savali 59th among starting pitchers, and I have Frankie Montas 50th. So that's about 15 spots lower than I had Montas going into last year, 15 to 20 spots lower. Um, but it's, it's around, it, it's just after, it's just after like Corey Kluber. Um, I actually have him behind like Marco Gonzalez and Dustin May who aren't, don't really have the same strikeout promise. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm expecting to get him as a discount if I get him at all, I guess. Um, but it, you know, you take the totality of those two months. It was a bad season, right? It was it was bad from Frankie Montas, the overall numbers. So I, I think that's fair. I'm just not ready to totally bury him, I guess, is my my takeaway from that last start, as impressive as it was. Yeah, I, I still like uh I still like Big Frankie. I um yeah. him and Savale, I wouldn't mind having as, you know, back into your your rotation. If you're in a roto league, normally I start six starting pitchers. If if one of those guys was my SP five or SP six, or uh, especially as a bench uh, pitcher, that would be awesome. But I, I wouldn't mind them being towards the back end of uh, one of my starters. I, I still do like both quite a bit. Let's do a little bit of rapid fire with some of these surprises that we saw uh, the final month of the season. Scott and Jared Walsh nine homers over his final twenty games of the season. He came up for the Angels. The current ADP for Walsh is. 194. He's the 23rd first baseman off the board. Getting pretty late as like your corner infielder. Are you buying what we saw down the stretch from Jared Walsh? It's it's difficult to go that far. I think 
Uh, where'd you say 194? Yeah, he's going just behind uh-huh. Josh Bell, just to put that in perspective. Uh, yeah, no, I'd rather... I, I have him 234, so I guess... I guess others are higher on him than me. I, I give him a chance because it wasn't just that he hit a bunch of home runs in a short period of time. He ended up with nine and 108 plate appearances. Uh, but he struck out only 13.9% of the time. And when we first saw him in the majors in 2019, it was 40.2% of the time. So we're talking like 13.9 is nothing. 13.9 is like, that's like in his prime Jose Altuve, right? That's... You, <laughs> That's a ridiculously low strikeout rate. Um, yeah, that is about what Jose... Uh, I guess Jose Altuve's had lower than that. But the last four years, he's been right around the level that Jared Walsh did in the short in 2019. Now, Walsh was between 25-30% strikeout rate for most of his minor league career. Not very good. Um, so we're still talking about this 30... This, this stretch of 108 plate appearances where he was something different and how much do we want to put on that? But... Like if a guy with power, which he clearly has, if he can keep the strikeouts down, good things are are going to result from that. Um, I'm just skeptical. I'm just skeptical because of the sample size, because he's a guy, you know, 27 years old already, and he's only now getting a real shot in the majors. And he doesn't walk much, so there's not much to fall back on if if the if he can't keep the strikeouts down. And I've read that he will start at first base for the Angels, and they're you know they're starting to phase out Albert Pujols as his final year of that whatever it was ten eleven year mega contract that he signed uh, way back when. But it seems like Walsh is going to get the opportunity to play every day. Um, Steamer seems closer to you. The Steamer projections on Fangraphs still has Walsh projected for a twenty nine percent strikeout rate. If that's the case, the batting average will likely be suboptimal. Scott, um, going three picks apart, would you rather have Walsh or Trey Mancini? Mancini, for sure. All righty. Good to know there. Um, let's stick with the Oreos. Your boy, John Means. <laughs> You've talked about him a lot this offseason. But in case other people weren't listening, final four starts for John Means. 1.52 ERA, 0.63 whip. Remind the good people out there, Scott, why you are such a fan of John Means. Uh, and many people are as a, as a late-round sleeper for this season. Yeah, I mean, he was just totally transformed from the beginning, his fastball velocity was up two miles per hour. That's a huge jump. I mean, he went he went to being this fireballing lefty when he was already a he already had amazing control. He's already a great strike thrower, and then he added this velocity onto it. And, and it didn't show up first in his ability to miss bats. His his first six six start, it was just a nine percent swinging strike rate. But then the last four, it jumped to fifteen point seven percent. That's opposite ends of the spectrum. That's like bottom quarter of the league to you know top ten swinging strike rate for John Means. Um, and like you said, that led to a one fifty two ERA, point six three with eleven point four strikeouts per nine innings in those final four starts. And so, like it, it, it just, it just really. It, I don't know what led to the jump in velocity in the first place, but if it's here to stay, then with his control, um, I think it, I think the outcome could be pretty exciting, as he showed in those final four starts. Yeah, and I'm pretty excited about him, too. I guess the one thing that you can say to throw some cold water on the John Means love is just the division that he pitches in and the fact that his home ballpark is Camden. So you worry about those things, has to face the Yankees. Red Sox lineup is still pretty damn good. Uh, Blue Jays are up and coming. So you worry about that, but, um, you know, if, if he pitches this well, if he's if he's throwing this hard and with this type of control uh, and getting as many swinging strikes as he did during that stretch, then it might not matter who he's facing. So definitely a late-round name to pay attention to. What about uh, another pitcher who's going pretty late? Brady Singer, Scott, final four starts. And I remember three of these starts were great, and one of them wasn't, and I believe it was either championship week or or the second to last week of the season, the semifinal week, because so many people were relying on Brady Singer and he let him down in that one start. Uh, but during those four starts, it was a 1.50 ERA, 0.71 whip for Brady Singer. Uh, I think he did something different during that time, right? That that helped him kind of get to this level? Yeah, he changed his pitch selection. He kind of ditched the change up and just went fastball slider. And apparently... Uh, he was he was working on tunneling those two pitches, which if you don't if you're not familiar with the term, it's 
making them appear similar out of the hand uh, so that the batter, you know, fooling the batter in that way so that they, they, they don't have enough time to adjust because it looks so similar out of the hand. And it, it, it seemed to work for him. It seemed to work for him because, yeah, three of the final four starts were awesome. And, like, really the overall numbers were strong too. 406 ERA, 1.17 whip, 8.5 K per nine for a rookie pitcher. I mean, I feel like normally that guy's getting hyped more than Singer seems to be. Um, ground ball rate was elite. So he certainly has that going for him. I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know if he can just continue with this fastball slider thing or if it's just a building block, then he's going to work back in the changeup and maybe even get better from here. I don't know. But I, it seems like he's pretty good just the way he is. And, um, you know, certainly I'd take him as like my number seven starting pitcher. Seven, eight would be great. Yeah, and there was he was a high draft pick, right? Like he was he's a yeah, legit prospect. First rounder. Yeah, first yeah. rounder in, in 2018. So it seems like... There probably should be more hype around him. I, I would like to see a third pitch, um, something to pay attention to throughout spring. But he, he he was considered like a high floor prospect versus the ceiling. Like he's not supposed to be a big bat misser, mm-hmm. but eight point five for an elite, eight point five K per nine for an elite ground ball guy, and certainly the nine point four K per nine he showed in those final four starts. I mean, maybe he'll end up being better in that area than expected. And going even later than John Means, Means has uh, this early ADP two thirteen. Brady Singer down at 233. Last name I wanted to bring up, uh, someone who I imagine is going later than both of those names. Yeah, way later, over 100 picks later. Adbert Alzale came up in 2019 for the Cubs. Um, I'm not sure that he was like a big name prospect, but had some interesting minor league numbers in terms of uh, the strikeouts at least. And uh, he also featured this new slider over his final two starts where he was pretty damn awesome, Scott. And, you know, they... They're in a transition period right now, the Cubs. It looks like he's going to have a spot in the rotation. Yeah, I th- I think it's Alzali, first of all. Okay. Edward Alzali. Um, but I am, I'm buying in hard here because that slider, he didn't have it. <laughs> he didn't have the pitch, and now it's his best pitch. And, like, he was getting by okay without it. He had, I don't think he allowed it. I think he allowed one hit in each of his first two major league starts in 2019. And he kind of got some hype and fantasy because of that. You know, they were both short outings, but one hit in each. It's kind of exciting. Uh, but then last year, introducing this slider, and it looks like a a pitch that's just going to pile up whiffs for him. And he ended up uh, in his, his stint with the Cubs. Now, it was only 21 in the third innings, but he had 12.2K per nine because that slider was so transformative. And he is going to get a shot it would appear since the cubs are kind of um you know not not looking to invest much in the major league roster right now it looks like so you know i i put together last week i spent the majority of the last week putting together my top 100 prospects and you know i kind of like to pile at the end of my top 100 picks uh guys who are maybe want to show up on other people's top 100 list but they're they're so cl- they're 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 ready to contribute right away. They're going to make an impact in the current season, and I think there's a chance they could end up being legitimate assets. So I made sure to get Adbert Alzali in my top 100 prospects, and I think he's closer to 90 even than the end. I'm, and I, I think we could look back and say, "Wow, I was too low on Alzali." That it, that's kind of what happened with Tony Gonsolin, where I wanted him in there because I thought there was a chance. Uh, but he wasn't like this huge prospect. And now it's like, uh, you know, I, I, I could have been even higher on him. I, I think looking back, we might end up saying that about Alzali because of this new slider. And he's free. He's free. So uh, remember the name, whatever you do. I mean, keep a running notepad on your iPhone, whatever kind of phone you have, sleepers that you hear about on podcasts, put the name Adbert Alzali in that discussion. We have a few dynasty questions here, Scott. I just wanted to wrap up with fantasy baseball at cbsi.com. Continue to send us your emails. This one's from Daniel Morales, 14-team dynasty startup. Doesn't say if it's head-to-head points, roto, or head-to-head categories. I would be giving up Brandon Woodruff, Dean Kramer, and Vidal Brujan, top 50 prospect overall in baseball of the Tampa Bay Rays, and would be getting back Tyler Glasnow, Cade Cavalli, and Dylan Dingler. Cavalli and Dingler, if 
Nobody has ever heard of these guys. It's okay. <laughs> you probably shouldn't have because they are uh, first round picks from 2020. They have yet to appear in the minors. They're a ways away. They are like both are expected not like they have an ETA of 2023, maybe even later than that. So uh, that's the trade, Scott Woodruff, Kramer, and Bruhan for Class Now, Cavalli, and Dingler in Dynasty. What do you think? I think I would have rather stuck with, or I would rather if it hasn't gone through yet. I'd, I'd rather stick with Woodruff, Kramer, and Bruhan. Woodruff and Glass now are both in their late 20s. So nobody has an, like a long term advantage there. And I, I rank Woodruff higher for the immediate future. I, I think I think he's a more stable, a, a stabler profile and, you know, it's dominant enough. So definitely Woodruff over Glass now, one for one there. Um, Kramer versus Cavalli, Cade Cavalli. I, I actually think Cade Cavalli's a, I mean, he was the 20th overall pick this year for the Nationals. He's probably their best prospect, and I, I think he's a good prospect. I think he's better long-term than Kramer. Kramer came closer to cracking my top 100. Neither of them did. Kramer appears to have a spot in the Orioles rotation already, um, but I'm not super confident in his in him being an impact player. And then Bruhan definitely have more faith in him as a prospect than Dingler. So yeah, I think Woodruff, Kramer, and Bruhan. Uh, I, I don't really see the argument for going Glass now, Cavalli, and Dingler instead because Cavalli over Kramer, that's really the only advantage that side has, and it's a small one. Agreed, 100%. Won't add anything there. This one's from Lucas, and this one's right up your alley, Scott. I've got a group of guys who have been playing redraft fantasy baseball for the past few years, but now we're thinking we want to take it to the next level and do a dynasty startup league. In general, we all really like the points league and want to keep that with the new dynasty startup, but I'm a little confused as to how the whole prospect thing works slash should work. So his question, the first year, obviously we will have a massive draft at first, but once we do that, is there a prospect draft we should do every year after that? I was thinking five minor league slots for each team, but I'm confused as to the whole prospect as to how the whole draft uh, prospect draft thing works. Uh, what purpose is there to a prospect draft? If you keep five minor league players on your roster anyways, should you only do a prospect draft draft? If you have space available on your minor league roster. So Scott, you have your Scott white dynasty league, which is a head to head points dynasty league. So if you want to kind of offer up what you do for that or any type of suggestion, um, it seems like it would be helpful for our guy Lucas here. Yeah. So the easy answer here would be to Google Scott White Dynasty League because I wrote uh, when when baseball was shut down for a while and there wasn't much to write about. I, I wrote this whole, this very long piece chronicling the Scott White Dynasty League, how it came to be, and kind of defending the rules, and actually included a link to the Constitution so you could model it after that, and and you know that. That might be better than anything I could explain here on this podcast. Um, but to answer the question, the direct question asked here, separate minor league draft, most dynasty leagues I've played in don't do that. Uh, I think unless you're creating this very clear distinction in terms of like a salary between major leaguers and minor leaguers and, and um, what kind of salary you're assigning each of them, then I don't know that it's necessary to split them up in that way. For the Scott White Dynasty League, uh, we do have a separate minor league draft that you know every other player is actually done via um, what we're calling a salary cap draft now, but we used to call an auction. So they're they're done that way, and um, they're assigned a salary based on what the actual bid was and then players who get taken in the minor league draft separately, they don't have a salary. So it, th there kind of needed to be a distinction for that particular setup. But I think in most dynasty leagues, it's, it's not necessary. It kind of uh, creates more variance in strategy. If you can allow people to jump in and take a minor leaguer amidst the major leaguers, so I, I don't I don't frown upon it in general, but my favorite dynasty league that I played in is the one I've set up, and and it did happen to distinguish it, though it, distinguish between them, though it was for a very specific reason. Yeah, so I think that's one way you could go about it. You can uh, distinguish, you know, major league talent versus minor league talent, and only have a 
select number of minor leaguers on your team, but the dynasty leagues that I've played in, it's basically a free for all. It's you can have as many major leaguers, however many minor leaguers. Obviously, you need to be able to field a team that is playing in the majors, so you need to have enough uh, major leaguers to have that. But you know, if you're going through a rebuild, you can have as many minor leaguers as you want. Take as many shots on these prospects and see who hits and who doesn't. And uh, every year, the draft that you have is a first-year player draft. So basically, whoever was taken the previous year in the MLB draft and whoever comes over from you know, international signings, Japan, Korea, whatever it might be, those players are included in the first-year player draft as well. We're going to wrap there. For Scott, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball City. We'll be back again tomorrow with Chris Towers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.